um, let me start off by letting y'all know this. I'm going to redo last week's lesson very quickly, go through it, because we're going to try to start recording these lessons so that way people can have them on DVD because people have been asking for them. So, <laughs> so, so, well, you know. But anyway, hey, people, people, whether it's one or two, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm going to go through it really quick. It won't take just a few minutes, and then we're going to get into uh, this week's lesson. Okay, remember we're studying how we got the Bible, and last week I showed you uh, how the Bible was originally written. Okay, now I want to go ahead and start out by saying this. You know, in our modern world today, the Bible is being scrutinized more than it's ever been before. And some people look at that as a bad thing because we think, oh, people shouldn't be questioning the Bible, and we got so many people doubting the Bible. And in a way, yeah, that's true. You know, it is kind of bad that you have so many people that doubt the Bible, but it also can be a good thing, too, that people are questioning it so much. Because the more they question it, the more of an opportunity that is for us to show them that it is truthful. So that's kind of an example of where we can take what some people would look at as a bad thing and can turn it out to our advantage. If they got these questions and they're wanting to know how do we know the Bible is really true and they have doubts about it, we can put those doubts to rest. We have the information and we can look at it and that's what these lessons are designed to do. They're designed to help you to be thoroughly equipped to be able to answer this. And it's important that we understand these things about this book, folks. Because our entire religion is based upon this book, and so it's important that you know how it was written. It's important that you know how it got transmitted to you today. You can't just have a blind faith and say, well, I believe it was accurate. I don't know how it was, but I just believe that the Bible we have today is an accurate representation of what they had originally. Well, you can't just have a blind faith about that. You need to know how, that is, how that's the case. Anyway, let's look at how the Bible was written. But before we do that again... Very quickly, let me give you just some basic, simple facts about the Bible. Okay, the Bible is not one book. It's actually a collection of 66 books. And again, these books are of different types. They're not all the same kind of writing. Some books are books of poetry. Some books are just historical books that record just straight history. Some books are actually letters that were written, from, or written to individuals or to churches. There's 39 books in the Old Testament and there's 27 in the New Testament. A quick breakdown of the Old Testament, the way you can categorize these books. The first five books, Genesis to Deuteronomy, are classified as the books of law. The books from Joshua to Esther are classified as the books of history. The books of poetry go from Job to Song of Solomon and then the prophets, which go from Isaiah to Malachi. And then you can even break those down into two subgroups, major and minor prophets. The New Testament breaks down again into four categories. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which record the life of Christ. History, which records the uh, work of the apostles going around and spreading Christianity and establishing the church. The letters, which go from the book of Romans all the way down through to Jude. And then the book of prophecy, which is Revelation. Now, here's some more, inf some more information about the Bible. Uh, the Bible is the world's top-selling book. There's no other book that comes close to how well the Bible is with regards to uh, being sold and being distributed. It's the most distributed book the world over. There's been a roughly about 6 billion Bibles sold since it was first printed in about uh, 1455. And there's about 30 million Bibles sold each year worldwide, so very popular. Now, what, what about the Bible as it stood in ancient times? It may be popular today, but that doesn't mean it was popular back in ancient times. In ancient times, it could have just been a bunch of nothing that nobody cared about. Well, the Bible as it was in ancient times was not written in English. It was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Now, Hebrew and Aramaic are the languages that it was written in in the Old Testament. 99% Hebrew with just a small few little portions written in Aramaic. And Aramaic is a very similar language to Hebrew. It's a, it's a sister language to that. And then the New Testament was written entirely in Greek. The Bible was written over a, about a 1500 year time period roughly. It was written from about 1400 BC all the way through to 100 AD. So roughly about 1500 years basically. It was written by about 40 different authors, and 
again over that long period of time. Now some people think that the Bible, you know, the, the Bible manuscripts that we have, people think, well, it's nothing but just a bunch of bits, pieces, fragments. Maybe, maybe they might be this good. We just have to piece it all together. It's just nothing but fragments. Well, it's true that we do have a lot of, of um, little pieces and bits of the Old Testament, a lot of fragments of it, but we also have a lot of full and complete texts of the, uh, of the manuscripts of the Bible. Texts that look like this, this, these, this. Full, complete text. We, we've got a lot of them. And again, remember, there's thousands of manuscripts of the Bible. There's not just a few hundred. There's thousands of them. For the New Testament, there's over 6,000 manuscripts for the New Testament. Nothing in ancient history comes close to that. The, the closest thing we can get as far as ancient books is Homer's Iliad, which was a book that get the guy named Homer wrote. And that book... We got 650 copies of it. And historians praise that book because they're so amazed that we have six, 650 copies of that book. It's so well preserved. But then you take, come over to the New Testament and we've got like 6,000 copies of that and all of a sudden, well, we just can't rely on the Bible. Well, you, just, you just can't trust it. That, that kind of shows you how biased some people can be. But let's look at the materials and the tools. The materials and the tools that they actually used to write back then, okay? One of the ways that they made paper back then is they would get just a big sheet of rawhide and they would just cut sheets of paper out of it. Pretty simple. And again, this is a lot better than the paper we have today because think about it, that's rawhide. You compare a piece of rawhide to a little piece of paper you get in any kind of a normal book, which one's going to be tougher? You know, people say all these manuscripts, they couldn't last long at all, they'd wear out so quick. I don't know about you, but rawhide lasts a long time. Now, the way they would make these scrolls out of pieces of paper is they would get those pieces of paper and put them together and sew them. Just sew them and sew them and sew them until you made this long sheet that you could roll up at the ends and you have a scroll. And if you look here really closely, you can kind of see the seam there where they sewed that scroll up. Now, another way they would make paper is out of papyrus or out of these reeds. And what they would do is they would get these reeds and they would skin them. They'd get the little peel off the outside of those reeds, have long little strip, little peels, and they would layer these peels together, put glue between them, and they would press them, and they would come out with paper that looked like that. Again, it's very tough, very durable, probably better than anything we got today. And the way they would write is they would basically get a stick with a really sharp point on it, dip it in an ink well and go to town with it. Very simple. That's the way it was done. Um, the Old Testament, the way it was constructed is the Old Testament was primarily written in scroll form. Scrolls like we think. And the, again, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and here's an example of what Hebrew looks like. And again, Hebrew, you read it this way. You start right here and go across. You know, in English, we go from here to here. But Hebrew, you read it backwards. Here's Genesis 1-1 in Hebrew, and I got it, you know, in English underneath it. In the beginning created God, the heaven, and the earth. Genesis 1-1. Now, the New Testament, let's look at the way they constructed it. The New Testament was not really written in scroll form. It was actually written in book form like we do today. By the time that the New Testament started being written, book form came into being really popular, and people started doing it in book form. Here's an example of what our oldest Greek manuscripts look like. This is Greek. And our oldest Greek manuscripts, like I told you last week, all letters are capital and there's no spacing between the words. You just wrote it all out, no spaces, all caps. Here's John 1.1, 1, 1, the way they wrote it. And I got it partitioned off for you, each little word divided off so you can see it. In the beginning was the Word, John 1.1. 1, 1. And here it is in lowercase with the spacing in it. Anyway, that's just what Greek looks like. That's what our Old Testament and New Testament manuscripts look like. Okay, that's what we covered last week, basically. I showed you the way that it was written and the materials that they used. Okay, now what we want to look at is how was the Bible copied? 
Okay, when Moses wrote his books, when Joshua wrote, Isaiah wrote, Paul, Peter, James, John, all of them, when they, when they wrote their writings, people took those writings and then they copied them, right? Well, how did they go about doing that? And did they have any kind of accuracy as to how they went about copying? Can we trust the way that the ancient people would preserve these texts and would pass them on and would copy them? Can we trust that? Or have the, these texts been so mutilated throughout the years that it's nothing like the original? Okay? First thing I want to point out is a couple of scriptures. Remember that Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 25, as he was quoting from the prophet Isaiah, he said, The word of the Lord endureth forever. Now those are the claims that Scripture makes. Your Bible makes those claims. It makes the claims that God's word is always going to be around. Let's see, very briefly, if the Bible lives up to its own claims. Let, let's see that for just a little bit tonight. Okay? You've got to understand, we don't have the originals. You know, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we don't have his original handwritten writings. We have copies of it. Copies of the originals. And as a matter of fact, we don't really just have copies. We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies is what we have. And that scares people. Because they, you know, they think, well, pff, you can't trust copies of copies. And the, the illustration everybody brings up is that whole game where you whisper something in somebody's ear and you pass it around the room and it always comes back to you totally different than what you originally said. I'm going to deal with that illustration in later lessons. But it worries people. How, how can we trust it? And you know, they didn't have copiers back then. You know, today when we want to make a copy of something, we don't put any thought into it at all. We just put it on a copier and hit a button. Well, they couldn't do that back then. There was no spell check to check and make sure everything you spelt was right. They had no word count to make sure you had the right amount of words in there. None of that. None of all the technologies that we have today that spoil us. They didn't have the convenience of those things. So what did they do to make sure that they, trend, they copied things accurately? I mean, today we couldn't imagine copying things without these. We couldn't imagine that. But they had to back then. Well, how did they do it without these things? Let's look at the Old Testament to begin with. How did they copy the Old Testament? Well, the way they copied the Old Testament was through scribes. They had scribes back then who would copy it. And the interesting thing about these scribes is that... Whoop, what I do? There you go. The interesting thing about these scribes is that they had a bunch of them. Let me show you just a few biblical references to the scribes. Ezra chapter 7 verse number 6 says that Ezra was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. So we learn from that Ezra himself was a scribe. Jeremiah 8 verse number 8 makes reference of the pen of the scribes. And then of course when you come over into the New Testament we read about the scribes and the Pharisees, right? Well, that's what the scribes did. They were the ones in charge of, you know copying God's Word and making sure that God's Word stayed preserved. Matthew chapter 2 verse number 4 says that when Christ was born that Herod went out and he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together and he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Now I want to make a little side comment here on Matthew 2 verse 4. Sometimes we tend to think that the Pharisees that the main reason they rejected Jesus is because they just were not convinced He was the Messiah? Well, that was probably true in some cases, but in cases like this, they knew He was the Messiah. Because think about it. They heard tell the Messiah was born. And so what are they going to do? We've got to kill Him. Well, we've got to figure out where He's at if we're going to kill Him. Well, how are we going to figure out where He's at? What does the Bible say? Where does the Bible say the Messiah is going to be born? We'll go out and kill him. So that tells you right there they knew he was the Messiah. They were going to the Bible to see where the Bible said he was going to be born at so they could kill him. That's pretty hard-hearted, y'all, to know he's the Messiah and you're still going to do that. But anyway, back on subject here. 
They copied the Old Testament through scribes. And these scribes that they had, y'all, were professionals. These were not a bunch of jokes running around just scribbling down something. I, I've heard people say before, oh, the Bible is nothing more than a bunch of desert sand scribblings. No, it's not. Not with the amount of work that they put into it. For an example, when these scribes went to copy the books of the Old Testament, whenever they went to copy the books of law, which are the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, they didn't sit there and copy it in one evening or a couple weeks or a month or two. And No. It took them one full year at least to copy just those first five books. You know, today when we go to copy a book, we can copy books instantly. We can copy multiple books within no time at all. We just take it down to the printing press and boy, they just churn them things out like hotcakes. Well, it took one year to get one, you know, copy of the book of law, the books of law. It took one year. And here's why it took so long. You think, why in the world does it take so long? You know, if you were living back then and you thought, I want to get me a copy of the first five books of the Bible. Well, okay, but it's going to take a year for you to get them. Why did it take so long? Well, one reason it took so long is because when these scribes copied it, they did not copy it phrase by phrase or word by word. They copied it letter by letter. You know, if we were to copy something, if, if you were sitting there and you're thinking, I want to copy this verse, God loved the world. What we would do is we would look, it says, God loved the world, and we would, God loved the world. We would translate phrase by phrase. And then sometimes some people will translate word by word. God, God, loved, loved. They didn't do that. It was letter by letter. G, G, O, O, D, D. That's the way they did it. Space, L, L, O, V. I mean, just letter by letter, counting as they went. And they even had to make sure of how good their handwriting was. Their handwriting had to be spot on. And once a scribe finished copying it, their counting was not done. Three other scribes had to come in after them and check it. It had to be checked at least three times through. And the way they would check it is these three other scribes would come in and they would count every letter. They would just go through it and count every letter to make sure it had the right amount of letters, right amount of words, everything was right. And a matter of fact, the first five books of the Bible, I can't even say that number. That's how many words are in the law. Words, not letters. That's just the words. Imagine counting how many letters that could be. Millions. They had to count them. And as they were checking it and they were proofreading it, they could only find three mistakes in it. Any more than three mistakes, they threw it out. Now here's the interesting thing about mistakes. You have to define that word mistakes here. When we think about a mistake in copying, we would think about something like, well, you added a word in here that's not original, or you took a word out, or you misspelled this. Yeah, those are mistakes, but let me tell you how detailed they got and what they counted as a mistake. They had rules so strict that they had rules even about the spacing of letters. Like, for instance, there was a rule to where letters could only get so close to each other. They could only be within a hair's breadth of each other. Any closer than that, if it accidentally teeny tiny little bit touched, it was counted as a mistake. Y'all, that is... You look at that and say, well, that's kind of nitpicking. Well, that just shows you how serious they were about preserving it. And they had a bunch more rules, a bunch more laws, a bunch more regulations that they would follow to make sure that they got a very, very extremely accurate copy. This was done by professionals, y'all. No jokes. Now here's an example of what Hebrew looks like from an actual Old Testament manuscript. And it may not look like it to you, but that's very neat handwriting. 
Because if you look at some of these letters, they look identical. Like here's two identical letters. I mean, look exactly the same. And there's even examples that get even neater than that. But I want you to see this. I think this is pretty interesting. I'm sure most of us have heard this verse before. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse number 18, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay, Jesus talks about a jot and a tittle. We've all read this verse, but I think a lot of people don't know what he's talking about there. A jot and a tittle? What is that? Let me show you what that is. A jot. What's a jot? A jot is actually the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's just a, the smallest little letter, teeny tiny. And a tittle is even smaller than that. Let me show you what a tittle looks like. These are Hebrew letters. Look at the top of these letters. Watch them very closely. Those are tittles. <laughs> Those are little decorative accent marks that they would put on top of the letters just for decoration. And they're actually smaller than that. I kind of enlarged them a little bit so you could kind of see them. That's what tittles are. And a matter of fact, if you go back and look at this, can you see them right there? There's a jot right there, and then there's those little tittles right there. So, what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5, 18, not one jot or one tittle is going to pass from the law until all be fulfilled. What Christ is saying there is that He was going to fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies about Him down to the T. He was trying to describe there in very strong language that he was going to dot every I and cross every T when it came to fulfilling those prophecies. He wasn't only just going to fulfill them, he was going to fulfill them very super, extremely, amazingly accurately. That's what Christ was talking about. So that's just another little inter interesting piece of information to give you. That's a jot and tittle right there. Here's something else I want you to think about. I mentioned to you just a second ago about how we have, you know, copies of copies of copies. It kind of worries folks. How do we know what we got is accurate? I want to show you something that you may not be aware of. This is a timeline, okay? This side of the timeline represents the time before Christ. This time represents the time after Christ. Here's your B.C. and here is your A.D. right here, okay? The Old Testament was written from about 1400 to 400 B.C. That's about the time frame that the Old Testament books were actually written. Back in 1611, when they went to make the King James Version, way back in the 1600s when all those people sat down and decided, we want to make us an English translation of the Bible. We want to make us the King James Version. Well, when they went to make the King James Version, they thought, okay, let's start, you know, translating the Old Testament. And their thought was, well, we've got to get our hands on the oldest Hebrew manuscripts we can find. We've we got to try to find the oldest Hebrew manuscripts. Do you want to know what the oldest Hebrew manuscripts they had at that time was? The oldest Hebrew manuscripts they had back in 1611 dated to here, y'all. 1,000 A.D. That's as old as they had. So that is a time frame of 1,400 years from the end of the Old Testament being written to the oldest manuscripts that they had. That's all they had. They didn't have manuscripts that dated back to the B.C.s. They just had it that they did here. So, if you really want to get right down to it, what they had when they were copying the King James Version was copies of copies of copy, 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 copy. That's what they had. And critics made fun of the King James Version and all this Bible-believing people back then because they thought, look at y'all, 
The Hebrew Old Testament was written way back then, but the only manuscripts y'all have date from 1000 A.D. And it's copies of copies. You can't trust it. You can't tell us anything like the original. Made fun of Christians. Made fun of people who believe the Bible for a long time. Well, as time went on, in 1947, which is about two years after World War II ended, I think, in about 1947, that's when they discovered, as some of you may know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the reason they called them the Dead Sea Scrolls is because they were found in the area of the Dead Sea. If you want to know what, what's the Dead Sea, look in the back of your Bible, your Bible map. It'll have a big sea on there and it'll say the Dead Sea. It was found in the area near the Dead Sea. Well, guess what these scrolls dated to? These scrolls dated way earlier. These scrolls actually dated back to about 150 B.C., which is a lot closer to this than that was. And again, you had critics and skeptics and everybody when they first found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they thought, ha, here we go. We're going to show you Bible thumpers what we've been saying all along. We're going to take these Dead Sea Scrolls and we're going to show you that these right over here don't match anything like these. They're totally different. They're so mutilated. Well, they compared them all right. And when they compared them, you know what ended up happening? Those manuscripts here and here were mirror images of each other. And you will not hardly find one skeptic today who will bring up the Dead Sea Scrolls and try to argue that, you know, these two don't go along. You just won't. That proves that the copying method, I mean, it's a thousand years from here to here, and they're mirror images of each other. Copied and copied and copied and copied and copied, and it's still that accurate. Now, I know what some people think. Some people think, well, how do you know these scrolls really dated back to 150 B.C.? What if those scrolls dated to here, 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 here? How do we know they're that old? How do we date these things? Well, I could go into a big, whole, long ex explanation of how they actually dated the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are multiple ways that they date it. And all these different ways of dating it all come back to that same time period. But simply, I'll just make it really simple for you. One way that they date it is the style in which those manuscripts were written. Because throughout the years, handwriting styles changed. And the handwriting style that these scrolls were written in matched the way they wrote around this particular time. And not only that, but they even found coins along with those manuscripts and those coins, which they found along with them, dated to this time period. And I could go on and on and on with all the different evidence they found as to how they dated to here, but scholars and skeptics don't question that. They all agree that, yes, that's about when it was written. And it may have even been written earlier than that, but that's just sort of a conservative estimate about when it probably was written. But I don't know about y'all, but I thank God for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because that really confirms what we've been saying all along. That really confirms how accurately uh, these people actually transmitted these things. Now, before we move on, do y'all have any thoughts or any questions over what I've shown you so far? Or just anything you want to add? But anyway, like I said, this, you know, this information is out there. It's not really that hard to get. You know, it's just basic stuff. But anyway, I, I want to go ahead and say this. The majority of people who attack the reliability of the Bible do not attack the Old Testament. They really don't. Now, I'm going to say this too. There are some variations between Old Testament manuscripts. There are. But y'all, it's so minuscule that most people don't even bother to bring it up. And I'm going to show you some of those variations in the next couple of lessons, but like I say, for the most part, critics don't even mess with the Old Testament. It's the New Testament that people really like to mess with. 
That's the New Testament that people really want to criticize. So let's look at how the New Testament was copied. Okay? Old Testament was copied through these professional scribes who had this whole big complex system that they would follow through to make sure that they got an accurate uh, copy and a whole big bunch of things they would do. But what about the New Testament? Well, for the most part, the New Testament was primarily copied by average everyday folks, for the most part. Just average Christians who just copied it. And let me give you a few references from the Bible itself. In Colossians 4 verse 6, when Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians, he says, When this epistle was read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. So the way they did these letters of Paul and these first, you know, books of the New Testament, what they would do is whenever Paul would write a letter to this particular church, they would get it, they would read it, they would study it, and then they would have to pass it on to another congregation. And their thinking was, well, if we pass it on to them, we're not going to have it anymore. So what's the logical thing to do? Let's run off a quick copy ourselves, and then we'll pass it on to them. And so the main people who were doing the copying of the New Testament were just average Christians, not professional scribes. Now, with that said, we do have some indication that there may have been people in the first century church who may have actually been professional scribes at one point. And here's how we know that. In Acts chapter 6, verse number 7, as the disciples were going around and they were, you know, preaching the gospel, the Bible says that the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So a lot of Jewish people were converting over to Christianity, and not just average everyday Jewish folks, but even the priests themselves. And the priests were the elite of the Jewish people who were responsible for keeping up with the Old Testament Scriptures. So you've got to think about it. Here you've got people who are used to dealing with the preservation of the Old Testament Scriptures. They've now become Christians. What do you think they're going to do with the New Testament Scriptures? They're probably going to help out in preserving them as well. And then in Acts chapter 23, verse number 9, we even have indications that some of the scribes were even beginning to side with Christianity, were being sympathetic toward Christianity. Acts 23, verse number 9, when Paul was arrested, many of the Jews were accusing him of doing all this wrongdoing, and there was this great uproar. They, drug, they took Paul out and brought him before this great big council of Jewish people. It said, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part rose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. You have the scribes siding with Paul here. So the vast majority of the New Testament was copied by average everyday folks, but we do have some indication that there probably were some people you know, who were used to Judaism, who were used to the way they handled those Old Testament scriptures, who did come over to Christianity and did help out with that in some degree. But like I said, for the most part it was just done by amateur copyists. Now we think, well, wait a minute, if you've got a bunch of amateurs copying this, they're not professionals, you can't trust what they copy, they can make a lot of mistakes, yada, yada, yada. Well, if you actually look at their, their manuscripts that they did, they're pretty well done. This is a copy of, of uh, a Greek manuscript, and if you look at it, it may not look very neat to you, but that's actually pretty neat handwriting as far as Greek goes, and as far as it being just free, free flow handwriting. That's pretty good. Now, here's the thing. I want to go ahead and make sure I get this in. The thing about it is, even if you have amateur copyists, even an amateur writer at this particular time is a better writer than we are today. Because they, how much handwriting do we actually do today in our modern world? We don't do a lot of it. You say, well, I do a lot of handwriting. I write out bills. I write out checks. Okay, yeah, you might do stuff like that. But I'm talking about actually sitting down and writing a book. We don't really do that today. Our handwriting skills are not as good as these people, folks used to be because they didn't have copiers. They didn't have computers. They didn't sit down and type stuff up. They didn't sit there and text on their phone. They wrote everything by hand every day. That's what they did. So even an amateur copyist back then would have been a lot better at copying than we are today. So we kind of look out down on them and think, oh, you can't copy anything by hand if you're an amateur and it be any good. 
Well, they may have been amateurs, but they were better at it than we would have been. And here's another thing. It's true that the majority of this was done by amateurs. And if you do have people who are not professionals, you are going to have more mistakes that are made. You just do. And in all honesty, our Greek New Testament texts, there are more variations between our Greek manuscripts than there are our Hebrew manuscripts. If you have amateur copyists, you are going to have more mistakes. But here's the thing. With amateur copyists, they made more copies than they did of the Old Testament. There were more copies of the New Testament in circulation at any one point in time than there were Old Testament texts. So you have amateur copyists, and they may make a few more mistakes, but being that you have so many of these Greek manuscripts floating around, you can catch these mistakes much easier. Because think about it. Let's say we got ten copies of the book of Colossians floating around. This, book, this copy of the book of Colossians reads this way. But these other nine copies read this way. There's your mistake. So that it kind of balances itself out. You have amateur copyists, so you have more mistakes, but you have them producing more manuscripts. And with more manuscripts floating around, that helps you to sniff out a mistake a lot easier. And I'm going to go into detail in, in, in that in later lessons, and we're really going to get into that. But I'll go ahead and say this. As far as the mistakes and the variations between manuscripts, 99% of those mistakes end up being nothing. Nothing. He put two P's at the beginning of Paul. He left out this letter here. It doesn't change anything. So we'll get into that next week. I'll show you some more about the different uh, variations. But anyway, appreciate you being here.